Well, here on CD Review, we're just a few minutes away from hearing the overall Building a Library recommended recording of Schubert's C minor Sonata Deutsch 958. Mitsuko Uchida's complete performance, but that's after the very first Schubert Lab of the week. Tom Service is our lab technician, maybe our senior research scientist, <laughs> using the Schubert Lab to get to the bottom of the man and his music. He's donned his white coat. He really has. There's a skeleton behind him. Tom, how's this going to work? Uh, it, it's going to work uh, with a blaze of insight from now until Saturday evening, Andrew. Yes, and it's all going to come from uh, what's inside uh, this lab coat and with the guests I'm going to be joined by uh, throughout the week. But this is the, the very first of the Schubert Labs, your three times a day dose of insight into Schubert's life and music. So as well as the lab coat, I'm surrounded by the apparatus for our forensic investigation of France's genius until Saturday evening. A skeleton that may or may not have belonged to at Francis Unwell on Twitter. Uh, a microscope, a pile of scores, a piano and a load of cameras too. That's because each of the Schubert Labs is being filmed. You'll be able to watch them all at the end of each day on the website and we'll be podcasting each episode too. So, eight days and eight lab projects. Eight questions for me and my guests to answer. So, let's have today's. Welcome to the Schubert Lab. This is today's lab project. How and why did Schubert physically create and write down nearly 22,000 bars of music in 1815? Uh, let's hear that again. How and why did Schubert physically create and write down nearly 22,000 bars of music in 1815? Well, so to help answer that question, I'm joined by Schubert biographer and Schubert's virtual emanuensis, Brian Newbold, and by music copyist Susan Brodigan, who's going to see if she can keep pace with the 18-year-old Schubert's uh, output in a day of writing out some of his music from 1815. And she's already uh, getting going over there, just opposite me. But before we hear from uh, Susan and Brian, let's get a sense of what Schubert was up to in that rather amazing year. Because even by his own standards, this was a prodigiously productive time. Now, we asked John Crace of The Guardian's Digest read to imagine what could have been in Schubert's diary. So Ralph Little brings an irrepressible teenage Schubert to rip-roaring and occasionally risque life. January. Started the year with a really bad hangover, so only managed to write about 20 songs. I really must learn not to waste so much time if I want to become a half-decent composer. Not that Dad thinks I ever will be. I played him a piano sonata I'd knocked out over lunch and he ran out of the room with his hands covering his ears. February. Just the two symphonies this month. Would have made it three if Dad hadn't forced me to waste most of my days teaching the half-witted students at his school. I wouldn't mind so much if the miserable old git bothered to pay me, but he just treats me as slave labour. Still, got my own back by forcing my most moronic class to copy out Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, which gave me enough free time to write a mass. For my dad, hopefully. March. I am in love. Oh, yes, sorry. Oh, that soprano, Teresa Grope, is one hot, hot babe. I've been writing a couple of songs for her a day. My favourite is Teresa Mein Lieber, I'm Your Justin Bieber. How can she resist? All too easily, apparently. You'll have to wait for a snog till we're married, Francie baby, she told me. Wait? What? I'm 18, for God's sake. If I have to hang on any longer, I'll be past it. Who ever thought that Minor Lieber and Justin Bieber would be rhymed together? Well, the Schubert Lab is the place for that to happen, possibly for the first time in recorded uh, civilization. Ralph Little uh, reading what John Crace thinks could have been uh, in Schubert's diary. Now, look, it, it's worth saying that not all of what you heard there was strictly biographically accurate. But look, Brian Newbold, the point is 1815 was uh, an explosion of musical creativity for Schubert. So look, just, just fill us on the, uh, in on the statistics. What did Schubert do that year? Well, in composition, he actually wrote about 22,000 bars. 22,000 bars. Yeah. Um, that's counting absolutely everything, and that's as close as I was able to get to the, uh, to the truth. But that included, what, four singspiels, four operas, basically? Four sing singspiele. Um, yes, a couple of symphonies, or at least a symphony and a half. And uh, getting off 150 songs. See, that's amazing, because that's almost, that's almost a quarter of his entire song yeah. output in one year. That's right, right. yes. D what yeah. do you think the, the, the reason for this was? I mean, because with that sort of level of productivity, and, that, and I think that works out as being about 60 bars a day, I'll get on to how Susan's mm. getting on with that in a minute, but, I mean, w was there a catalyst uh, behind this, do you think? 
Uh, well, it could have been the great success of a song the previous year, uh, Gretchen, Gretchen Spinnerada, the uh, spinning wheel song, um, which made him think, yes, I can do it. And so he was going to show the world <laughs> in 1815 that he could do it. And, uh, and out came this outpouring. Something that uh, John Creason and Ralph Little uh, made reference to love, Teresa Grob. I mean, Schubert was in love with this soprano, and m many of the songs were either addressed to her or written for her, and uh, parts in, in a mass he wrote in 1815 as well, written specifically for her. I mean, w surely that, that must have been important. Here's this short 18-year-old who's able to do something that no one else can, and, and he's able to express his, his unrequited love for Teresa Grob. Is, is that That's what right. was going on? Well, it depends how you read the memoirs, and the way I read them is, yes, um, probably it, it was love of a kind and the previous year he'd given her a solo soprano part in his mass in F which was a huge success there was another catalyst because all everybody who mattered in Vienna was there listening to this mass in F in 1814 which Schubert conducted himself at the age of 17 um, and uh, yes she was an important part of that. So we, f we forget that, because that was a big public moment that he, he would have thought, OK, now I'm a serious composer at 17, <laughs> and so when he's 18, then you, know, you, can, you can keep going forward. That's right. I, I mean, it, it slightly gives the lie to the idea that he, he wasn't really a public musician at this point. I mean, in his mind, he, he wanted to be. He wanted to be, and he already was, yes. And, of course, there are all the friends who were catalysts as well, because they, they would say to him, look, you've got to set this song. And so there was this... Great outpouring of song. And, and the friends were, were important at this stage as well, even when he was 18? Surely, yeah. Who in particular? Oh, well, um, uh, Spaun, I think, was, was the lifelong one. Uh, he was a fellow student, and, th and they got on so well together. And uh, he was a very loyal, he was the most loyal of all, I think, to, to Schubert. But he would be the important one. Uh, did he meet uh, th this, uh, th somebody who we're going to be hearing quite a lot of through the week? This, mm -hmm. He has a rather dissolute reputation in Schubert's circle, Franz von, von Schober. Yes, yes. Did, uh, did he, he met Schober yes. this year as well? Yeah, Schober was there. And, uh, yes, of course. And he was setting Schober's poetry already. Um, and uh, some very fine songs. Mm. I mean, better songs than the poetry is. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, any, any questions for Brian that you've got mm. today, uh, the address is, uh, as ever, for throughout the spirit of Schubert, schubert at bbc.co.uk. Now, Susan Brodigan, I've got I've to ask you, you know, you, you to look up from your copying here. Look, how are you feeling? You've got basically 60 bars at least to copy out. We're not going to ask you actually to compose Schubert, uh, as Brian has done, uh, but rather just to, to simply copy things out. I mean, how, how, first of all, how are you feeling? You haven't got RSI yet or anything in the no, right No, no. I've, um, I've about 21 bars in now, so... Um, well, that's pretty good. Doing well, yeah. Uh, just... I'm on one four, four voice piece here, so I'm working away. So, uh, and what's your plan for? I mean, what other pieces are you going to be doing for 1850? Well, I'm going to try have it between orchestral and um, and then leader and some smaller works as well because out of the 22,000 bars, I think about half of that was orchestral. So I'm easing myself in with some smaller works at the minute so I don't go cross-eyed <laughs> with the symphony just yet. No, and of course, uh, a symphony, all those parts to copy, that's a much bigger deal. So that's going to take more time. Yes, exactly. I mean, do you, as uh, somebody who works in the BBC Sheet Music Library and works as a music copyist, I mean, do you, uh, d what do you feel about, uh, how do you think Schubert was able to do it? I've been thinking about this this morning. and I, I wonder if he, he, maybe he was an insomniac or maybe he was just able to tune out all of the noise that would have been around him. But even to write 60 bars a day, every single day, no break, I think is an astonishing feat. I really wonder how he managed it. Uh, and Brian also, I mean, he was doing other things in his doing life. An awful lot. Yeah, well, yes, he was teaching was in his father's music. school. I mean, and also, remember that these figures we've come up with don't allow a single day off per year. <laughs> every day of the week, right through the year. Okay. Um, yes, and he was uh, meeting his friends, he was doing a little bit of teaching, um, he uh, went along to his reading circle, and um, he liked to have a walk every day. Uh, I think his life was probably quite irregular at this moment. Later on in life, he settled down to a sort of routine of, of nine to two o'clock composing. Right, yeah. But um, whether he managed to keep to that at this stage, I don't know. He probably went overran that. But he was, you know, he was living a teenage life, wasn't he? Falling he was. in love, drinking oh, a bit, yeah. probably. I mean, having fun as well oh, as yeah. in the middle of all yes. this. Yes. Susan, there's no, t no time for you to drink today, I guess, but we'll let you have some coffee, maybe. Thanks very much. That's very kind. Uh, but, uh, but uh, Brian, I mean, it, I, I suppose it's just the sense of kind of awe in the face of this achievement, even this pile of scores, most of a lot of which he wrote in 1815 on our table here. Well, when you see it on a table like that, isn't it amazing? <laughs> yes. Of course, um, w w it's, the, it's the writing of a symphony which takes the time, when you've got 11 staves mm. to fill in. Indeed. Brian, um, Susan, <laughs> Brian, Susan, thank you for now. Look, uh, a reminder of uh, here's how to get in touch.
The Schubert Lab with Tom Service. Email schubert at bbc.co.uk or text 8311. Well, thanks to Brian Newbold uh, for being with us today. We'll all be back, uh, Susan, Brian and I, just after 2pm to find out how Susan's getting on. She's still writing away there. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, and we'll also be joined in the lab by performance psychologist Andy Evans to find out what was going on in that amazing 18-year-old brain of Schubert's. More from me and my lab coat then, just after 2 o'clock. Andrew. Tom, thanks very much indeed. That's going to be fascinating. You're listening to the first...